Welcome to section 2.8b. All right, gentle people, in the last lecture we talked about symbolic representation. In this lecture, what we're going to do is put together the periodic table and see how it can be useful to us. So let's start out with the father of the periodic table, or one of the fathers of the periodic table, Mendeleev. Now what Mendeleev did is this slick little exercise. What he did is he grabbed all the known elements at his time and he put each element on a single card. Now when he put the element on a single card, he wrote down all the information, all the reactions he knew about the chemical. For example, on the lithium card, what he saw was that lithium combines in a 2 to 1 ratio with oxygen, a 3 to 1 ratio with nitrogen. And he saw that sodium kind of did the same thing, 2 to 1 with oxygen, 3 to 1 with nitrogen. And the same thing with potassium right here. And so what he did is he took all his cards, lined them up by weight. And what he found is he saw that there was this repeating pattern. He saw that after about eight elements, the reactivities repeated themselves. So based on this initial 1 through 20, he started to construct what we now know as the periodic table. He decided to go ahead and arrange the elements based on their chemical reactivity and their atomic weight. And so what we have now is the periodic table based on these ideas. Now it's really neat what Mendeleev did. At the time that he was constructing his periodic table, germanium had not been discovered. But what Mendeleev did is he left a spot open for this germanium card. And he said that you're going to go ahead and find this element and here are the properties of these elements. And when they eventually did, they found that Mendeleev was pretty close. He also corrected some errors and some weights of some other elements. All in all, this was a big stride into putting our periodic table together. Although he did make a couple of mistakes. One thing is we do not order the periodic table based on atomic weight. We order the periodic table based on atomic number. So the modern day periodic table is based on the number of protons an atom has. On a side note, Mendeleev was kind of an ass and didn't recognize this mistake and accused other measurements as incorrect when he kind of did a little bit of an error when, when putting his periodic table together. But that's here nor there. Let's go ahead and talk about the periodic table. The first thing you should note is the periodic table is arranged based on elemental reactivity. Now we can go ahead and paint the periodic table with large categorizations. The first is metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. A metallic compound is something which we consider as something that has a high luster, meaning it's very shiny. It has very good conductivity, both electrically and thermally, and it is ductile and malleable. A ductile meaning it can be pulled into wires, malleable meaning it can be pounded into flat sheets. You guys will note that most of the periodic table is considered metallic. Now the non-metals, well, these things come in various forms. They can be gases, liquids, and soft solids. Uh, when we look at the solids, they crumble easy. They're very brittle. They're very poor conductors, and they usually have a low melting point. Now the non-metals are going to be on the right hand side of the periodic table where the metals are on the left hand. Now in between the metals and non-metals are something that is called the metalloids. And like their name implies, these are kind of metallic. So they have properties between a metal and a non-metal. Now what I want you guys to note is I'm not gonna be very strict and say, oh, is this element here a metalloid? Is it a metal or is it a non-metal? The importance here is I want you to know the general makeup of the periodic table. Left-hand side metals, right-hand side non-metals, and somewhere in between around here is kind of this blurry area that are considered metalloids. 
Now we can further classify the periodic table by going down a column in a periodic table or a family in a periodic table. Sometimes they refer to these as groups. Now the first column in our periodic table are called the alkali metals. The second column, the alkali earth metals. Now the block right after these two columns is called the transition metals. And then we're going to swing over to the other end of the periodic table. The very last row on the periodic table are called the noble gases. And the one right next to the noble gases are called the halogens. The lanthanides and the actinides are offset from the periodic table. Now you guys should memorize these groups and know their general location. So let's go back to the last lecture and, and talk about making ions. Like I mentioned before, to make an ion, you're going to lose or gain electrons. Now the question becomes, how do we know if an element is going to gain or lose electrons? And so we're going to start out with a simple rule, and we'll explain this rule a little bit later down the line. So for now, what I want you to think is if I want to make an ion, the ion that's most probable is the one where I get this element to have the same number of electrons as a noble gas. So let's talk about sodium and chloride. So here's my periodic table. Now, when I want to make ions, I want them to have the same number of electrons as a neutral noble gas. So here are the numbers that I want to shoot for. 2, 10, 18, 36, 54, and 85 electrons. So let's take a look at sodium. Sodium is right here, and so I have two choices. I can go ahead and gain a whole bunch of electrons. Namely, I can gain seven more electrons, and then I'll have the same number of electrons as argon, 18 electrons. Or what I can do is I can go ahead and lose an electron. If I lose one electron from sodium's 11 electrons, then what I will have is 10 electrons. Since losing one is easier than gaining seven, I'm going to go ahead and choose to lose one electron. So what you'll find is that sodium tends to make the one plus ion. Now let's take a look at chlorine. So here's chlorine on the periodic table, and it has 17 electrons. So what it can do is I can gain one electron and be 18 electrons, or I can lose seven electrons and then get 10 electrons and have the same number of electrons as neon. And so again here, gaining one is easier than losing seven. And so in this case, chlorine is going to tend to gain one electron. So if we think about this process that we just talked about, what you'll notice is that sodium was a metal. It was on the left-hand side of the periodic table. What we can say is that metals tend to lose electrons. Now, chlorine was a halogen. It's on the right-hand side of the periodic table. It's considered a non-metal. And so non-metals, which are on the right-hand side of the periodic table, they tend to gain electrons. So what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to memorize some common charges. Now, I don't want you to memorize all these ones, but it'll make life easier if you start to memorize or recognize patterns. So when we talked about sodium, what you guys can see is that potassium is going to behave the same way. It's easier for it to lose one electron than to gain seven. So what you guys will see is that the first column in my periodic table, well, it likes to lose one electron and become a positive one ion. So the common charge for this first column is plus one. For the second column, what you might have guessed is that it's easier to lose two electrons than to go ahead and gain six. And so again, this second column, what you'll see is that the common ions are two pluses. Now, I don't want you to worry about 
the transition metals. So there's no need to memorize any of this in the middle. It turns out that transition metals can have variable charges or variable common ions. So we'll go ahead and talk about why this, this is the case later, but just for now, understand that transition metals have various charges. So then if we start looking at the nonmetals, what we can do is work our way right to left. Well, the halogens are only one electron different from my noble gases. And so what's going to happen is these things are going to gain one electron. If they gain one electron, they have a minus one charge. So halogens go to the negative one ion. The next group over, they're two away from the noble gases, so they're going to go ahead and gain two electrons. And I can keep doing this pattern going to the left. Now here's the deal. Uh, some of these get a little bit tricky because what you'll notice is the metalloids start to come in. So I don't want you guys to worry about these weird ones on the bottom. Um, I want you guys to know aluminum right here and then anything that is boxed. So let's say it like this. What I want you guys to memorize is anything that is boxed that I have not crossed out. This group of yellow on the right hand side, this light blue on the left hand side. I should note one weird element and its common charges, and that is hydrogen. What you guys will see is that hydrogen can go both ways. It can be the plus one ion, or I can make hydride, which is the minus one ion. So it's a little strange because it sits at the very top of the periodic table. Well, I hope that made sense, Chem1A, and remember to stay safe.